for those that don't know, my name is Anthony Adams. I'm a careers counsellor based in the UK, and I've put these this series of events together for this week for students that might be interested in studying overseas. And we kick off today with today's session, both Carolyn and Anne, who will um, no doubt give themselves an introduction, but they are two uh, recruiters. They work in the International Relations Office at the University of Leiden and Tilburg University. And they're going to give us an overview of what it could be like to study in the Netherlands. What I will do in the chat, some of you will already know because you're already registered for the events during the rest of the week. I'll pop in links to other events that you may be interested in participating in through the chat. So it gives me great pleasure. The format of the event is very much informational. However, it is interactive. So will there be some polls for you to participate in? And if you want to um, drop some messages in the chat, please do. And uh, I encourage you guys to ask lots of questions. So over to you, Anne. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry you guys cannot see us, but uh, I hope that our voices are clear and I apologize for any background noise. I have a screen moving itself. Uh, my name is Anne, I'll do the beginning part of the presentation and I represent Tilburg University and maybe you want to hear Carolyn's voice as well before we get started. Or not. <laughs> I think she's on mute. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and take it away then. Um, we uh, are both part of a group of universities that often collaborate together. So I just want to highlight that the story that we're going to tell you it was constructed by this group. Uh, we call ourselves the Dutch Research University Consortium and we are a selection of research universities in the Netherlands. Um, so we really tried to make it kind of a broad story that covers roughly the general aspects of studying in the Netherlands. Now I want to start with the question, why the Netherlands? And we actually have a poll for you. Um, so I was wondering if you could go to the link, which you can see at the bottom corner of your slide, careerscalendar.joinlive.mobi, um, to answer this question. So I'm curious if you have actually been to the Netherlands and the options are yes, no, or only in my dreams. So maybe you've dreamt about the Netherlands, but not visited yet. So when you go to careerscalendar.joinlive.mobi, you should be able to uh, join this um, poll. We try to attempt to make it uh, interactive. So if it doesn't work, then... Uh... Oh, I see someone has been able to answer the poll. That's great. Try it myself as well. Now, throughout the presentation, we just have a few of these polls, which will be via the same platform. So you can just then open up your browser. It's not all the time. It's just uh, for us to get an idea of, of who you guys are. And I see that everyone has been to the Netherlands, either in real life or in their dreams. That's great. Um, I'll wait a little bit longer to see for the other ones to, uh, to also respond. I think we're stuck at 67%. Great, so you're already a little bit familiar with the Netherlands. That's always a good starting point when you're listening to this presentation. So we asked our students why they would want to consider the Netherlands as a study destination. And there's a couple of reasons that they listed, um, which we'll go over in this presentation. Some of it has to do with the student experience, with the value for money that you get in the Netherlands, the specific career uh, opportunities, et cetera. So let me first take you to the first point on the list, which is actually peace of mind. In the Netherlands, you can really be assured that you can get a quality education because all of the Dutch research universities and universities of applied sciences are accredited by the Dutch government. That's the NVAO logo on the slide. Um, and that's a very rigorous accreditation process. Um, universities really have to work hard to retain their accreditation. And we also believe in access to education. So universities across the country, north, south, east or west, have to meet the same standards. So it's very different from the UK where you've got the, uh, maybe the uh, Russell Group universities and the others. In the Netherlands, we're much more egalitarian and we want to make sure that uh, quality is similar across the different institutions. So this has something to do with our egalitarian mindset. Also, the uh, universities are all very highly ranked. You can find all of the research universities in the top 250 worldwide in the Times Higher Education, for example. And this is nice for you to know because it means that your degree will be recognized abroad and it will be portable as well. 
And all of this together makes the Dutch universities belong to the top 2% of universities worldwide. So the system as a whole is very highly regarded. Now, there's lots of programs available in English. Um, the universities really uh, want to be internationally minded and therefore offer programs in, uh, in English so that we can really bring knowledge to people from different places and also so that people from around the world can contribute and study here as well. Um, so it's very easy to get around with English, not just in the education, but also in the country. Generally, English is very widely spoken, so you could actually get away with studying being here for three full years and still not learning any Dutch. Um, it's also a very pleasant country to live. Uh, in general, it's a very safe country, very low crime rate, so it's easy to get around and you can feel quite secure even when it's later in the evening, although we always you know, recommend to be mindful and be smart about it, but in general it's a very safe place to be. And it's also one of the happiest places on earth. I think the latest uh, source was the World Happiness Report uh, that reported this. So, you know, in general, you can expect that it's a pleasant place to live, easygoing, um, uh, English speaking and, uh, and friendly. Now, you do have to be aware that even though English is widely spoken, you have to expect some new cultural experiences because, of course, the education will be in English. As I said, you can get around with English, but you're still choosing the Netherlands. So it's not you know, United States or UK light. I'm doing air quotes, which you cannot see, but you can imagine what I'm trying to say. Um, it's really a different country with a different culture. And that's why also we've posted this student here on a bike. Uh, cycling is really the way to get around, for example, in the Netherlands. Um, so you will get used to it very quickly and easily. Um, yeah, you're also going to become acquainted with some of the more Dutch aspects, such as the diet, uh, our lovely, uh, not so well-known cuisine, uh, eating some herring and things like that, and also other cultural experiences. So we think this is a really enriching part of your experience, but you do have to be aware that that's what's going to happen. Um, and it's, it's really nice if you're open to that as well. What's also nice is that you can expect a really active student experience. Uh, most universities have lots of opportunities for you to become active outside of just your studies by engaging in a, a student organization, study association. There's different clubs, for example, debating clubs, sport clubs, Model United Nations, you name it, and many of the Dutch universities have it. And we also have a poll question here. So we'll go back to your phones and uh, see how you feel about this next question. We are curious how important extracurricular activities are for you in universities. Are they very important? Maybe you haven't given it much thought or they're really not important at all. All of this is possible. Some people really honest. I like that. That's always good to know. I can imagine also, I don't know what age you guys are. Maybe you're still quite young. Maybe it's difficult to imagine what it's like to study at a university, especially a university in the Netherlands. So I see that it's pretty 50-50. I can tell you from experience that a lot of students really value this active student experience, especially when they get to, uh, to university, they realize how valuable it is because this is also a way to make friends, a way to develop certain skills that you may not develop while studying. Um, so we encourage you definitely once you get to the Netherlands to seek these out. Now, what's also important, what kind of support and service can you expect at Dutch universities? In general, we have quite well laid out, very modern universities that have all kinds of services in place. For example, every program has an academic advisor who you can turn to for support. Um, if you have, uh, for example, questions about your study progress, uh, what kind of majors or minors to choose. Uh, lots of universities have uh, psychologists in service as well. There's uh, administrative service, which I think the picture here is an example of. So if you need transcripts or things like that, you can turn to those. Um, some universities also have housing support. And uh, one thing that is important to know is that in the Netherlands, we have uh, independence as quite an important um, aspect of our culture. So all these services are there, but you do have to be aware that you have to make a step as well to reach out to them. So um, studying in the Netherlands in general requires a little bit of independence from your side as well. So I just wanted to put that out there. Now, another reason that a lot of uh, students choose the Netherlands is because of the uh, competitive tuition fees. And as you might have heard, uh, the tuition fees in the Netherlands are set by the Dutch government for all EU and EEA citizens. Um, and they are based on your passport, not your residency. 
So if you have a passport from the EU or the European Economic Area, the EEA, you can benefit from these subsidized fees. Now, most of you may be British passport holders, I'm not 100% sure, um, but of course, due to Brexit, the situation has changed a little bit. Um, so if you are only a British passport holder or you have a passport from outside the European Economic Area, unfortunately, that means you cannot benefit from these subsidized fees. However, you'll see that uh, on this slide that the tuition fees for uh, students from outside the EU is still quite competitive and it's more affordable than studying in the UK in general. We gave a pretty wide range here from 6,000 to 15,000 euros. But of course, most of the programs are somewhere in the middle uh, around, you know, between 9,000 and 11,000 euros. So if you converted that to British pounds, you would see that it's, it's relatively affordable still. Um, but it is something to be aware of basically. And it would be good to do some research also uh, when you look at different university programs, because if tuition fee is an important factor for you, you'll find that for non-EU students, there is a bit of difference because the universities can determine these fees themselves. Generally, we are not for profit, so we're not gonna try to uh, make a profit out of this or set the tuition fee really high. We try to keep it as low as we can, but there are some differences between the two. In terms of living expenses, you have to account for that as well. Um, on average, students spend between 700 and 1300 euros per month. Um, the most important thing that impacts how much you spend is actually your rent and the city where you live. The closer you get to Amsterdam, the more you generally spend um, because the rent is higher, but also something simple like a beer will easily be 20 or 30 cents more expensive than in a, in a different city. So this is something to keep in mind also when you are exploring a uh, university in the Netherlands. Um, in general, the further away you get from Amsterdam, the easier it is to find housing and the more affordable housing is, I would say, as well. And this is based on a student budget, so it's not going out to dinner every single night. It's mostly cooking at home and every once in a while going out uh, to dinner. Uh, but it does include students' ability to, to have a party, for example. Now, in terms of financial resources, there are a few options available. First and foremost, for those of you who are EU passport holders, you can get more information about uh, tuition fee loans for the Dutch government from the website duo.nl. This is run by the Dutch, uh, Dutch government and it has really reliable information about uh, loans that you would qualify for. Um, there are also quite a lot of students who work part-time to give themselves some extra uh, pocket money. Now, for those of you who are not EU passport holders, there are some availabilities as well. And one thing that you might like to know is that uh, most of the scholarship money, if it is available, will go to non-EU students. So that is something uh, that is beneficial. It's also nice to know that as a non-EU student, you are actually allowed to work outside of your studies. There's just a few limitations. Um, one of them is that uh, there's a limit of 16 hours per week. Um, but in general, most students don't work that much because that would be really impactful on, on the time that you can spend on your studies. So most students are more around 12 hours or eight hours a week. Um, one other thing is that the uh, employer would have to apply for a work permit. But uh, if you are uh, interested in different types of jobs, there are plenty of opportunities out there. A lot of our students have part-time jobs next to their studies as well. And of course, your other financial resources, there might people's abilities that you can take from home and maybe there's a local loan or grant or of course your own financial means play a role as well now what about the career options um, every student who graduates from the netherlands who is from outside the eu receives a one-year visa after graduation which we call the orientation year and during this time you can look for a job in the netherlands without the employer having to apply for a work permit there are lots of multinational companies in the Netherlands. A lot of them have recently also moved, unfortunately, sorry, from London to Amsterdam. So we see a real surge in multinationals. And that also means that there are more and more jobs available where Dutch is not mandatory. Um, a lot of universities also have career offices. So this can also help you get started. Um, they generally offer workshops and trainings to help you get oriented towards the labor market um, and do things like how to apply for a job, for example, they give some trainings as well. How do you write a cover letter, etc. Now, what are some of those multinationals available? Here are just a few on the slide. Of course, there are many more, but this is just to give you an indication of some of those multinationals and many of them have Dutch roots. Um, many of them you might even not have realized that they are Dutch companies. Um, 
but here's just an, an overview for you to get an indication. There are also, also a lot of multinational organizations in the Netherlands and NGOs. Um, you might know that the International Criminal Court is in The Hague as well. So lots of students stick around for the uh, nonprofit kind of sector as well. Now, in the next section, we want to delve a little bit more into university life. So, for example, what kinds of degrees are available? And what you'll find is that uh, most degrees are focused degrees, so-called focused degrees, where you obtain a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Laws. And the focus is specifically on one discipline. So this is quite similar to what you find in the UK. For example, if you want to study economics, your curriculum is pretty set. You get certain courses that belong to economics, macro, micro, etc. And it allows you to become a specialist in that field as well. In general, uh, this means you do an in-depth bachelor and a lot of students will do the master as well, which is the specialization. But we also have the option to do a multi or interdisciplinary degree. And actually, I forgot to put it on the slide, but in general, you also uh, obtain a bachelor of science or a bachelor of arts from these types of degrees. Um, the cool thing about this is that you can combine multiple academic disciplines and it's not very common in the UK. So this is something that actually the Netherlands is becoming quite good at. Um, in this case, you could, for example, um, in the example of economics that I just gave, combine it with law or with psychology. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, in a lot of cases, you can even compile your own curriculum or otherwise there will be a set curriculum, but with uh, different disciplines in mind. Some examples are the liberal arts and sciences uh, degrees, which are you might be familiar with from the US, as well as, for example, PPLE. Uh, politics, philosophy, law, and economics. These are just two of the examples. There are more out there as well. So keep an eye out when you're looking for degrees um, of the possibilities to combine multiple fields. In general, that means that you have a broad bachelor's degree, but then you do your specialization afterwards in your master's degree. So it is very common for students to do complete a master in the Netherlands, regardless of whether you've done a focused bachelor's or a multidisciplinary bachelor's. Now, how do you go about finding your program? We have a really helpful website, studyinholland.nl, where you can um, find a really helpful search engine to look for degrees. Um, and in general, you might already have an idea of kind of the field that you're looking for. And then this search engine is really helpful because it allows you to select uh, certain filters. For example, uh, you can search for uh, programs in a certain area. There's language filters and there's other filters here on the left as well that I couldn't fit on the slide. Um, and in most cases, the program that you're interested in will also determine what type of university you will go to. Um, but I will give the floor to Carolyn, who I hope can unmute herself because she's going to introduce you to the Dutch education system and what I mean by different types of universities. Thanks, Anne. I did manage to get myself unmuted, so hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> I can hear you. Excellent. <laughs> so yes, uh, hopefully that gives you a great idea about why and, and some really amazing reasons to, to consider the Netherlands and then how to search for programs. But it's good to know a little bit about the education system itself. So we're going to get into some practical matters now. Because in the Netherlands, there is what's called a binary system. That means there's two types of higher education um, uh, systems you could study in. And like Anne said, the topic that you're going to study will usually dictate which of these you will study at, but there are some, some overlaps. And so there's a University of Applied Science, which is a professional higher education institution, and a research university, which are academic educational programs. All of these will give you those bachelors that Emma was talking about a bit earlier. To go a little deeper, the research universities are academic education, like I said, um, so a lot of students will think of these as sort of traditional universities, and they have topics um, you know, all over the place, which I'll get to in just a moment. But these are three-year programs, generally followed by the one or two-year master. Uh, almost all students will go on to a master at some point. And because these are research universities, there's a final research thesis or capstone project that's required in every program that a student would study. These are very in-depth programs, fast-paced, a lot of material to get through, um, really learning about you know, why we do things and, and the theory behind uh, you know, why things occur and so forth. Learning a little bit about the application, of course, 
Um, but the whole point isn't just about the how or the very specific logistical things. It's, it's a lot of independent learning. Um, so you will have in, in class time, of course, and actually quite a high number of contact hours per week, usually at least around that 15 to 20, if not higher for the STEM subjects, for example. But you will have a lot of independent learning outside your classroom as well, so time management is super important. Now, the research universities offer over 100 programs that are taught in English and there we wanted to share the categories of research universities as well so you get a sense of, of where you might study. There are a number, uh, the majority of them are comprehensive universities, meaning they have several faculties, they, they offer topics like medicine or law or psychology or history or languages or uh, archaeology, you know, these kinds of, of, of things, plus all sorts of other, you know, international relations and, and those uh, and, and these types of topics um, and many, many others. But there's also um, four specialized universities, three of which are called universities of technology. So the engineering and technical subjects are taught there very exclusively. Um, and we do have an agricultural university as well. So again, specializing in, in those particular areas. Within these research universities, you'll find the university colleges. And these are honors colleges within the universities that offer the liberal arts and sciences interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary programs that were mentioned earlier by Anne. And these university colleges are special programs within the research universities um, that um, offer this type of curriculum that is very flexible. You can personalize your curriculum. You can mix and match those majors. Again, that, that multidisciplinary that you've heard about. Um, they're often residential, so students will often live together and learn together in the same um, community atmosphere or campus. Um, and they are selective programs normally because they're much smaller scale um, communities as well. So university colleges are a part of research universities and there are some specializations within the universities as well in terms of the technological programs. There's over 100 programs taught here. The universities of applied sciences are professional higher education. So that means that each of the programs you might study there is tied to a professional or labor market um, job or career. And they're four-year programs. There, there are some accelerated tracks uh, available, but generally they're four-year bachelor programs because they include work experience and internships. But these are still higher educational programs, so you will finish with a bachelor. They're more hands-on, so applied, just like in the name would, would, uh, would imply, that you're, they're learning about how to do things um, more than the why we do things. Um, so for example, you might be studying communications and you would learn how to do um, you know, a press conference or a communication plan versus learning about how humans communicate and how we might relate that into the world, for example. So less academic, more theoretical, sorry, less academic and theoretical, but more um, uh, applied and hands-on in that kind of sense. And in that, you'll have more class time. You'll tend to be nine to five throughout the week for the most part in class. There'll be a little bit less independent learning in that sense too for your learning styles. And there's more than 200 programs that are taught in English at these kinds of institutions. There are many available and they're all um, wonderful institutions. There are comprehensive institutions as well that might offer anything from fashion design um, through to you know, some types of marketing or, uh, you know, uh, nursing or, or different types of, of topics, uh, even some types of teaching are taught here. But also the music conservatories and fine arts academies fall into this particular category. So if you have a talent and you want to be studying in, in, in a particular way, then that's in the University of Applied Science because you're doing your art and you're, you're, you're uh, very much hands on there. And also the hotel schools fall into this category. So that hotel management and, and these kinds of, of options will fall into the University of Applied Science um, category. So it's good to know that there's these two options, but generally you're choosing a topic, it will be offered at one or the other. Where there is an overlap, then it's important to look a little deeper so you can see. Now I want to regroup uh, and, and just sort of go over again sort of the differences here or what would make a good fit for you in each of these. So like we said, the program normally dictates. However, when there is a choice, you know, if you're looking at research universities, if you love to really get into a topic and get super in depth and do a lot of reading and, and maybe a lot of debate and critical thinking and discussion, if you're, uh, you know, again, an academically, uh, an academic thinker or overall, if you're good with time management, if you're good with working well independently, this is a good fit. Um, and then, of course, if you're considering further education, like a master or possibly even a PhD someday, then the research university is certainly for you. And for the University of Applied Sciences, if you like to learn things by doing them, you know, if you like a more structured or guided type of environment, this is also a good option for you. And if you're really looking to work right after your bachelor, then this is the kind of program that would really suit you overall. So hopefully one of these options will be a good fit for you overall. So that's what you can study uh, in the Netherlands. Now, how do you actually apply when you get to that point? 
Um, and I believe we have a, um, um, a poll here. So actually, I'd like for you to go back to the careerscalendar.joinlive.mobi because I'm actually curious a little bit about the programs you're interested in. And maybe if you already know, whether you're looking at a broad program, if you're looking at something more focused, or if you really like the idea of that interdisciplinary um, type of program, if you have any idea, or if you don't know, you know, let us know in the online poll um, uh, software there. I see someone already wants to study something specific, so that's great. <laughs> um, if there's anybody else who has an idea yet, please let us know. And it's okay if you don't. That's why these presentations are taking place to help you decide for that. Um, but certainly, we have someone who's maybe thinking about um, an interdisciplinary program. Uh, and just keeping in mind that, of course, there's many different options within the interdisciplinary programs. Uh, and you'll see this more and more, even in what looks like a specific program, you will often have a bit of interdisciplinary uh, learning there as well. So I think we'll move on. Oh, so we have somebody who's admitting they don't know. Thank you so much, because I think a lot of people in the audience may not know. And it's perfectly normal and fine to not know at this particular point. So please don't feel pressure. We didn't want to pressure you <laughs> to do that. We're just curious to hear a little bit more about you. So that gives you um, a little bit about um, the universities as well. Um, I'm curious if any of you have submitted an application to a Dutch university just yet. Um, I don't know if we have any applicants in the audience. Sometimes this time of year we do. Um, and, and this will help. Uh, this next section. But of course, if you haven't applied yet, then we're going to help give you some um, overview and guidelines to, to, to know what to look for and to know what to expect in the application system. So I think we can go on back to the presentation, I think, Anne. Um, we've got to people who haven't applied yet, so that's good to know. Now, in the Netherlands, um, admissions is based on generally is based on the diploma that you're studying in secondary school and if it's equivalent to a Dutch student who's preparing to come to higher education in the Netherlands. So I'm going to focus here on research universities because that's the type of institution that both Anne and I work at at Leiden and Tilburg. And so for a research university, if you're studying the International Baccalaureate or IB diploma and you will end up with the full IB diploma, that is accepted across um, the country in terms of a, an acceptable um, diploma. If you're doing three academic A levels with grades of C or higher, that would also be accepted. For some of you, you might be doing the American High School Diploma, and we tend to look for that plus three or four AP courses with exams, and sometimes there's a GPA specified, so it's important to look per institution and program to be sure. And of course, all the European Secondary School Diplomas that give access to higher education in their home country, but over 40 other diplomas are also admissible. So if your diploma is not on this list, do not fret. These are just some of the typical ones that we see and that are seen as equivalent and you would be able to apply to a research university. Now, in terms of further requirements, um, some programs might have specific subjects. So you can imagine if you're gonna study um, uh, some kind of biomedical science, you're gonna need you know, different types of sciences and maths and so forth. Um, you know, is there a minimum score for your particular diploma? Do you not study in English fully in secondary school? So might you need an English language proficiency test? There's lots of other possibilities. So it's important to check per program but you know, the diploma is really the starting point. And for 80% of the programs, the diploma that I mentioned earlier or the equivalent diplomas on our websites will be sufficient to be admitted to most programs. So 80% of programs. If you've got the diploma, we think you're academically capable. We're going to give you a chance because we have an, uh, an open application system. We're really about access and having a right to higher education if you're qualified. However, there's a couple of things for students to check. And one of those things is does the program have a selection process? And 20% of the programs in the country have a selection process that's beyond this diploma. Um, and we mention it here because again, per program, you do need to make a roadmap for yourself to realize what kind of admissions process there is, what documents are required, what the deadlines are, all these kinds of things we're talking about today. And there's three times of selection. Um, they're here on the list here and right in front of you. And one of them is talent-based selection, which is you know, if you're going to study, you know, music or art or something like this, you need to have a talent. You know, you, you might have to do a, an audition or have a portfolio, but you have to prove that you have that ability um, and that talent. So it's pretty self-explanatory. 
There are small scale and intensive programs such as the university colleges that have liberal arts and sciences, the hotel schools, and a few other programs fall into this category. And because they have their own environments, their own communities, they are allowed to have a selection process. And they tend to be a holistic process where they'll look at grades, but other aspects like extracurriculars, um, maybe your proficiency in certain areas, maybe there'll be a selection day. There's lots of different ways that students can be selected. So it's important to have an inventory of what that is for those programs. And the last one here is numerous fixes, which are the most selective programs in the country because they are very popular topics of study. Um, sometimes there's a limit to the labor market later on, or sometimes it's literally just physical space is limited for this particular program. So you'll find programs like medicine here, um, international relations and organizations falls into this, psychology falls into this category many times, certain types of business, there are certain types of engineering that might fall into this dentistry and so forth. Um, so there are limitations for these particular programs because they are just so popular they have to select the program or their students somehow. So double check if any of those things are, are uh, pertaining to the programs that you're looking at. So again, 20% are selective, 80% are based on your diploma. So check per university and per program. So not just university, make sure you know per program what to expect. Now, in terms of the logistics of applying, we don't have any specialized procedures or deadlines. We don't have a UCAS, we don't have a Common App, um, and every university has their own application process. So it's important, and this will be on the next slide in a moment, to look at the instructions and follow them. <laughs> um, so uh, we, that's really the, the only sort of uh, general message that we can have here is read the application instructions per program, and then really go piece by piece through and follow them bit by bit as you go through and complete and submit that application per program. Um, it, it's as simple as that and sometimes it won't feel so simple because it will be overwhelming, there'll be lots of instructions or you'll have to look on different websites because you're applying to a number of programs, but that's where we do recommend maybe even making an Excel sheet so you know all the bits and pieces per program of what you have to do and when you have to do it. Now, we do have a central administration system called StudiLink. Um, and that is part of the application process. So it's actually twofold. When I said earlier that each university has their own system and way of applying, that's true. But you also have to register in our national database, StudiLink, to be able to start your program. Now, whether you start in StudiLink with a registration or whether you do it later in your process after you've applied to your program, it will vary per university, but it's always two parts, StudiLink and the university application um, itself. And you can register in uh, StudiLink for up to four programs at any given time, um, and then you'll do your applications. There are further restrictions on those numerous fixes programs I mentioned, those highly selected programs. You can only apply to two, but there's further restrictions on a few programs, such as medicine or physiotherapy. You can only apply to one. The others, if they're not selective, then you can apply to, again, up to the, the four programs. If you don't get into a new program or you change your mind, you can take one out, put another one in. So again, four programs at any given point as long as the deadlines will still allow you to apply, of course. Um, we wanna make sure that you remember your, your login and your password details, sounds silly, but for StudiLink, it's, it can be challenging to remake those, so make sure you keep those uh, handy for you. And if you have problems, reach out right away to the program you're applying to. They can help you with StudiLink, they can help you with the program application forms, but don't wait too long. Make sure that you are asking right away so that people can help you as quickly as possible. Also make sure that you're checking your spam and junk folders because as you go through the application processes, sometimes important emails can get filtered out. So it's important to double check that. Now, deadlines range quite drastically across the country as well. The selected programs have earlier deadlines starting from December 1st and going to May 1st, but the most important deadline is the numerous fixes deadline, which is January 15th. That's the only standardized deadline um, for international students across the country. And there are no exceptions. There tend to be no exceptions for selective programs regardless, um, but double check your deadline to make sure you know. And for non-selective programs, often they're for, uh, you know, you're looking anywhere around sort of April, May timeframes um, for, for most students, but some for the EU citizens can go a little longer. So sometimes into the summertime. But it's important to take a look and I would recommend applying as early as possible so that you don't run into any problems. And also if you're looking for student housing, the earlier you apply, the easier it is to find housing. So that's something that's really important to remember as well. Um, I think we're going on to the next here. So this is when we get to our general questions and we're gonna open the floor now um, for a few moments to have you answer or to ask the questions that you might have. Um, you can ask them in the chat, I believe here. Um, 
you know, what concerns you have, what questions maybe that we didn't, um, you know, uh, mention, or if you want to go more deeply into something. Oh, Ethan has a question here. Uh, is it easy to find a job in the Netherlands without speaking Dutch? Well, it is, of course, more challenging, um, but it is absolutely possible. So I think Anne can attest to this as well. I mean, we all have student assistants that are international that don't speak Dutch that work on campus. I have a lot of students that have worked you know, even in the, the, the restaurant um, sort of uh, area or working in bars or grocery stores and these kinds of things, sometimes clothing stores um, in the more international cities. So it is possible, but it's not something that will usually happen straight away when you first start looking for a job. It might take a little time to find one. Um, so it's important to not rely on it the week that you arrive. Uh, Anne, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's pretty clear. Yep. Other questions or concerns do you do you all have about studying abroad or studying in the Netherlands in general? I've got two questions that come up quite frequently. Mm -hmm. So the first one being the difference in in the university culture between the Netherlands and, and perhaps the UK, because we have a model of what it's like here in the UK. How's it different in the Netherlands? And then the second question is how how do we address the employability challenge that so many students face to ensure that they are ready for the world of work wherever they go, whether it be applied or research institutions, and then on into their next, the next stage of their life? Which one do you want to take, uh, Carolyn? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the first, but then it sort of slipped my mind. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. How is it different? How is it different? Yeah, the, the difference in culture. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, the difference in culture, I think, I think it's, instead of comparing it one-on-one, -on -one, I think it's important maybe to look at the Netherlands as, because they're three-year programs, um, you're coming in, you're, you're tending to study something from the beginning, you're jumping in full, uh, full on, and you're really expected to work hard and get the, like past the majority of your, your courses and your exams um, in your first year, which require a, a lot of attention, a lot of classwork, a lot of extra work. Um, and you have to do those uh, a passing of the uh, exams to get what's called binding study advice, um, which is actually not advisory, but it's very binding. And if you don't pass a certain number of exams, you're not allowed to go on to second year. So first year is very serious. And I, and I think that that is a maybe a big difference to lots of other systems around the world actually and the way I also understand sort of a bit of the UK system. So while we want you to have fun also and have a good student life, um, you definitely have to make sure that you are, you know, getting in and starting and working right from the beginning. So I think that's a big difference. And do you have something else? Yeah, we... another thing, I think we actually have quite a few similarities to the UK in terms of, you know, you guys have Freshers Week, we have that too. Um, I think the 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 social aspect it has some similarities with the uk i've heard that in general we have a few more contact hours than than is the case in the uk so that might be a difference um i think that that roughly covers it gives an indication i mean the best way to get a feel for it is to get in touch with our students or to visit the campuses but that's a bit tricky maybe this year Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think maybe one of the other things that's different is housing, um, because we don't tend to have residence halls per se in the Netherlands. Yeah. There are big buildings that have lots of students in them, and some of them will feel like dorms, um, but we don't tend to do meal plans and that sort of thing. So you do have to be independent and live, uh, you know, be able to cook and clean for yourself. And the, the housing is not um, guaranteed in most cases. In some cases it is, but in most cases it's not. So students yeah. are often living off campus and, and living on their own or with other students in a shared facility and so forth. So I think that's a difference as well and good to understand. Mm. Yeah. A couple of more questions. Then, yeah. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of more questions in the chat. So Ethan's asked there, uh, with COVID and Brexit, is it a good idea to apply this year for a uni in the Netherlands? So that's, that must have been, that must be a question that you're asked quite often, right? Yeah, it's really difficult because um, the situation is not, yeah, it's difficult for us to plan ahead and to look far ahead. So I can imagine that it's difficult for you to plan as well. Um, so far, universities have been teaching online, so they've found good in-between solutions. Um, and in the case of some programs, it's possible to defer. But in that case, I would recommend that you look at how selective the program is, because for those really selective programs, it's usually not possible to defer. So in that case, I would recommend indeed to, to be quite sure that you want to take the leap 
next year. Um, the good thing is, if you're in the UK, you're not in China. So, you know, if, if, if need be, you, you could get someone to drive you <laughs> through the tunnel to the Netherlands. So it's easier to still at least get here, even with COVID. But student life will feel a bit different, that's for sure. I don't know if you want to add anything, Carolyn. No, I mean, because we don't have a crystal ball, of course. I mean, I, I, the expectation is, of course, that there'll be a lot more normalcy in September. Um, uh, and I know that the Dutch universities, the, their preference, of course, is to be in person. So, you know, as soon as it's safe to do so, they will be. So it's, it's hard to know. The next couple of months will tell, mm. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the Brexit point. So students can, can get a visa. I mean, how's that, how's that all going to unfold for, for students coming from the UK with a, with a UK passport? Yeah, with the UK passport, I mean, all of the admissions offices will be assisting um, all students for visas, you know, through the admissions process. Like, that's how it works in the Netherlands, so you won't have to figure it out on your own, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it just means that your deadline may be earlier, so you have to double check your deadline if you need that visa, of course. Um, uh, but in terms of those kinds of paperwork issues, it's really not too much of an issue in that sense. The difference, of course, is that the tuition fees are, are higher this year because of this. Um, and that we might have a few more students applying this year. It's hard, it's hard to say with COVID, um, but I think that'll settle down in, in the coming years as well. So the, I don't think Brexit's a reason not to come to the Netherlands. <laughs> um, certainly, I think that we still have, uh, you know, competitive fees, like Anne was saying earlier in the presentation. Uh, and there's no sort of difficulties, per se, that a, a, Brit a British student would experience. Also, if you're British and you have a second passport that's an EU passport, you can apply with that. So that's something to also keep in mind um, if you're a dual citizen somewhere. Yeah. Um, we have a few minutes left, but we have some slides where we introduce our universities. Maybe it's a good idea to um, introduce ourselves real quick so that you know what kind of programs we offer or what do you think, Anthony? Yeah, go for it. There is one more question uh, from Archie. So he's, he's asked, um, with an applied sciences um, and their amount of time spent in class, how practical are jobs to paying off rent? So, uh, okay, I've I would, that. yeah, I would say University of Applied Sciences only marginally have more class time than research universities. It's not like you're suddenly in class forty hours a week. So. Also at Applied Science University, students are in class maybe 20, 25 hours a week. So there's always flexibility to have a part-time job. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that, um, the, the Q&A. Please do proceed on to giving yourselves a full introduction. Sure. All right. We'll do a quick one anyway, because we don't want to uh, spend too much time. Um, so uh, for me, for Tilburg University, a quick overview of where we are located. We are in the south of the Netherlands, uh, about an hour and a half south of Amsterdam, but as you can see, very close to other major cities. It's a tiny country anyway, so it's very easy to get around. Um, we are known for our motto, which is understanding society. We try to uh, kind of make students aware of society around them. And we do that through giving every student at least one philosophy course as well. It's also kind of tied into the uh, programs that we offer, which I'll show you afterwards. We're a medium sized university with about 19,000 students and more than 130 different nationalities. About 18% of our student body is fully international. And of course we have Dutch and international programs. So the international students are concentrated in the international programs. We're especially well known for social sciences, business and economics and law, um, which I'll show you in this slide. This is an overview of all of the disciplines that we offer. As you can see, uh, these are our programs in the field of uh, business administration, entrepreneurship and economics, where we're very highly ranked and very well known. Um, and as you can see, also very specialized programs. So we really separated the, the business and the economics. We have a few quantitative programs as well, cognitive science and artificial intelligence, which looks at human computer interaction. So it's both computer programming as well as cognitive neuroscience. We have a data science and an econometrics program, which is like an applied maths program. We have a couple of programs in the field of social and behavioral sciences. And as Carolyn mentioned, uh, psychology is often a numerous fixes program, and that's the case for us as well. 
We have our university college where we offer our broad and interdisciplinary liberal arts and sciences program that you guys know all about now. And then we have these degrees, our global law program, uh, where you learn about the big legal systems in the world. And you also have an opportunity to do a conversion course in the UK afterwards in case you wanted to specialize. So it gives you a broad global perspective on law and our online culture, art, media and society, which looks at culture in a digitalizing and globalizing society. Now, if you want to know more about Tilburg, feel free to get on our mailing list, tilburguniversity.edu slash keep in touch or tilburguniversity.edu slash my brochure to create your own online brochure. Um, you can also just navigate to the website in case you want to know more about these degrees. And then I'll give the floor to Carolyn to give you a quick introduction. Perfect. You'll have to whip through some of these slides somewhat quickly, Anne. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so certainly uh, Leiden University is actually the oldest institution in the country. So we were founded in 1575. We have a number of different programs. So I think we can go to the next slide. Um, we're about 31,000 students, which is a large institution by Dutch standards. Um, and, and our 14 English taught programs range between about 30 and 60% international student body, depending on the program. Um, of course, many nationalities, that changes every year, but highly international classrooms and professors overall. And we're located in two cities. So depending on where you're studying, you will be either in Leiden or 10 minutes away in The Hague. Um, both of uh, places are excellent student cities with thousands of students there um, to create such a student experience for you. Um, and we're really focused on making a scientific and societal impact. So the programs that we offer in English are focused really in our areas of expertise, but where we can make the most impact. So I'm gonna go through the, the programs here sort of in sections. So if we go to the next slide, um, I put it in, in the end, we'll see two lists here and uh, from the cities that we are in. So in Leiden, we have our Faculty of Ar Archaeology. Um, so for students who are interested in uh, a multidisciplinary program with science and history and different aspects of that, that's uh, something that not a lot of students think about. Um, there's quite a lot of science and students are digging from their first year in that particular program. Um, the next set uh, of um, types of programs are what we call uh, sort of language or area studies programs. So language, culture, history types of programs in South and Southeast Asia. Um, Dutch studies, our English language and culture falls into this particular category. And our linguistics program, which is all about studying languages and how they make us human and how we document them, these kinds of things. The next set of programs is sort of what people think of traditional humanities programs, but we actually have a different modern spin. So for our art history program, it's a specialization in arts, media, and society. And they'll look at the last hundred years or so of art history and how society has impacted what we see in art, but also how art has impacted society. So all the way up to social media and artivists like Banksy, for example, are being studied in this program. And philosophy is comparing both Eastern and Western philosophy. So it's a comparative perspective program. It's normally a study one or the other, but not both. And the last set of programs that are offered in Leiden are our social sciences, which is Le Leiden is also very no well known for. So we have cultural anthropology and development sociology, which is all about groups of people, populations of people and their behaviors. And there's a specialization that uh, allows you to make documentaries in that program. So there's a digitization specialization that uh, students who like journalism really often will, will choose this program. And psychology, of course, is all about the individual and why we do the things we do with many different perspectives to learn from. And it is a numerous fixes program like at Tilburg. It's a selective program. Now, 10 minutes away in The Hague, it's the International City of Peace, Justice, and Security. So all the programs that we offer there will follow these uh, types of themes. We have security studies, which is all about the threats to security in the world today, whether that's natural disasters or organized crime or terrorism, and also looking at counterterrorism as a reaction. So looking at issues by case study around the world and how we can make an impact on those in the future. And urban studies, which is a, a multidisciplinary program as well, that uses cities as its main focus. And students will look at multiculturalism, sustainability, uh, safety, and health um, uh, from the, use those perspectives to really investigate cities overall, and you'll become an urbanist when you're done. The other programs that we offer in The Hague are sort of international relations um, uh, adjacent, so to speak, or exactly international relations. So our political science program is all about the organizations um, that are in the international relations landscape around the world and parliamentary politics and human rights and these kinds of things. International studies is all about being a regional specialist in one of eight regions of the world and you'll study politics, economics, culture, and history of these regions along with a light and language from that region. So again, another multidisciplinary program. 
And last but not least, we have Leiden University College The Hague, which is our liberal arts and sciences honors college in the center of The Hague, and it is residential. It has six majors that are focused on different global challenges like world politics, uh, earth energy and sustainability, global public health, governance, economics, and development, international justice, and culture, history, and society. So you can mix and match and really personalize your curriculum there. So you'll see the themes through all of those programs are really looking at making some kind of impact, whether that's scientific or societal, and you'll see the listings, what is taught in Leiden and what is taught in The Hague. Now go to, I think, maybe my last slide, I think. It's second to last slide. Yes, last slide. The last slide, um, yeah. Yeah, so you can uh, certainly connect with us after day through our webinar week and our experience days. We have lots of things online, whether they're virtual tours or tryout modules. You can always chat with a student. If you scan the QR code on the screen there, you'll go straight to the Bachelor Part of our website where you'll have access to all of these things. And you can always email me at study at and we can help you further as well. So I think that wraps us up in terms of unis. Um, are there any last questions in the chat? Oh, this actually is important. Um, did we say anything about Drew and before? Yeah, we did, we did. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to know so, how sure everyone is that the Netherlands will be their country for their future studies, but now I don't know if I put options. Oh yeah, I did. So yeah, one last question in our, in our platform. Are you, are you sure or you know, how sure are you? That you might come to the Netherlands for your future studies. Have we helped in that, hopefully? <laughs> well, this part is not working out the way I want to, but... <laughs> well, we hope the big blue means that all of you are thinking of the Netherlands. As an yeah, option. basically it does. Yeah. It was a good try. It was a good try. We tried to make it as interactive as we could, for sure. What I'll do then, guys, thank you so much for that. That was so insightful, and I appreciate that um, it's quite difficult to give an education system an overview in, in such a short amount of time, but you did an incredibly good job at it, and you're highly skilled at what you do. If anybody in the chat has any questions, just drop them through whilst we're just finishing up, and if we've got time, we'll definitely answer them. If you're a UK student that's looking to study in the Netherlands, it's fairly straightforward, the process, as you can see here. And what I'll do post this event, I'll wrap the recording up and I'll send it to you via an email. So thank you, Carolyn. I'm going to switch to my screen, if that's OK. Thank you, Carolyn and Anne. Can you, yeah. can you see my screen? Yes. yes. So um, that's just a visual of who we've been talking to today, Carolyn and Anne, one from Leiden, the other from Tilburg. And this week we have a series of events, as I mentioned earlier, study in Canada tomorrow, careers in hospitality and a design thinking workshop with an Italian design school. So you can access all of this information on the link app.careerscalendar.com but also you can access other events that are taking place across this country and globally. And then of course, come and follow us on our social media channels at Careers Calendar. So that concludes today's session. So I hope you all, did, all enjoyed it. If you've got any questions, do follow up with an email. I'm, I'd just like to finish by thanking Carolyn and Anne. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. <laughs> no worries, my pleasure anytime.